USA, a design consultancy service specializing in the research and development of this new architecture. In 2013, she launched CPDI Africa, the culture-inspired initiative that promotes these new architectural languages through design competitions, lecture series, workshops, architecture exhibitions, and international global studios for teaching African-centered architecture. Cultivating a built environment career that has spanned over 25 years, Madali lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and Abuja, Nigeria, where she continues to offer international consultancy services in urban design and real estate asset management. An impressive bio. And now we get to hear the person who's at the forefront of this work, Madali Okumabwa. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mickey Harris. Um, <laughs> Was all of that me? Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Truly glad to be back on the Africa Awareness um, Week platform after many years, uh, actually 15. Um, so I will go ahead and get my screen shared um, and jump into our presentation. Okay, um, is everyone seeing? And can you hear me? Yes. 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 All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Africa Awareness Week 2020. Thrilled to be here. My name is Madli Okumabwa. Yes, founder of CPDI Africa, the global studio for African centered architecture. The lecture today is titled African American Architecture Defined Inspirations from African Culture, Technology, and Community Development. A professor once told me black architects are not innovators. He said what black architects do is copy and paste other people's culture, their cultural architecture as their own. He told me that day in jury review that my African inspired interpretation of the design brief was impossible, that African culture and aesthetics could not be translated into the built environment. He said the European and Asian students had the right to represent their cultures in their projects because design philosophies originating from their nations had been fully evolved and transformed. African architecture did not exist, he explained, as black architects had not contributed anything to the discourse of contemporary architecture. Horrified by his position, it challenged me to prove, to prove him wrong or right. I set out on a personal journey of self-discovery, unearthing my own identity, my heritage, my history. It was a quest to discover architecture as defined by the people of Africa. Now I will set the scenario. Where did that conversation come from? 25 years ago, I was a student studying architecture. Like everyone who dreams of becoming an architect, I love drawing houses. I got accepted to a program in design. I was having a wonderful time studying, learning about architects all around the world, you know, just the evolution of design. Um, I never thought for half a second that anything was wrong with my education. I was having a wonderful time. Um, none of what had been said just previously was on my mind until I attended NOMA, a conference in 1994. NOMA stands for the National Organization of Minority Architects. And at this conference at Howard University, my life was changed forever. I met Professor David Hughes. He was presenting on his research from Africa. He had just spent many years traveling the entire continent um, researching, photographing, and he wrote a book called Afrocentric Architecture, a Design Primer. And so he was giving a lecture on, 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 on his studies and my mind was blown. I had never thought of architecture from an African perspective. Oh my God. I mean, at that moment, I just thought, oh my goodness, that's right. I remembered I was from Nigeria. At this point, I've been in the States 
um, for about 10 years. And, um, you know, you come here and you want to assimilate, you want to fit in. I just forgot, forgot all about the fact that I was from Nigeria. So I was just really proud and excited to get back to school and reference all he had taught in, in his lecture in my next design brief. And basically his theory was Afrocentric architecture was a distinctive manifestation of form, imagery, and space in the modern built environment, which derives from the cultural, environmental, and historical origins of the continent of Africa. So I'm excited and I get back to school and I present my research. I dug up my Igbo identity, like Professor Harris said, I'm half Nigerian, half American, so my father's Igbo. So I pulled on the Igbo culture that I remembered. I remembered the works of Dimas Wonko, who she also mentioned um, in, in his work. I mean, I'd grown up around his architecture all along, but never realized that what made it unique was that his architecture was pulling on African identity. And so, um, I incorporate Igbo culture and aesthetics and spirituality into my project and I present it. And this is where my professor happily tells me, you know, Madly, I'm sorry, you just can't put Africa and, and black and architecture in the same sentence. We have not contributed. So it was the shock of my life. Um, that day I left design school and went on to finish in urban studies, eventually getting my master's in, in African studies from Clark Atlanta University. What I wanted to do was to prove him right or wrong, but this journey I knew I would have to take on my own to understand what he was speaking of. So the first thing we have to do is define architecture itself, right? Once we understand that, we have a clearer perspective. There's architecture, there's African architecture, and of course, there's African American architecture, and that's where I'm going to end in this lecture today. What is architecture? It is, it is defined as the art and science of constructing a building. An extended definition will say is the reflection of your culture, your lifestyle, aesthetics, local building materials, climate, geography, political and economic purchasing power of a people and a place. So that would mean anyone anywhere in any country or nation would have an architectural language, right? So. Here are a few examples of world architecture, right? So let's imagine we close our eyes and we open up and we're in a space filled with buildings that look like the one we see on the far left. Okay, maybe I'm in Japan or China, if I'm familiar with their aesthetic. Or open my eyes and I'm surrounded by buildings that look like the gingerbread designs of the Dutch. Okay, maybe I'm in Holland. The American red brick McMansion. I might be in the United States. India, where their deities I represented on the facades of their building. Okay, maybe I'm in India. Or in a space where opulence, riches, wealth, also pulling on their culture and heritage, I may be in Dubai. Chinatown, anywhere, any, anywhere in the world, you look around, you see aesthetics like these. And it's not just the aesthetics, the signature curve of their roofs, but it's also how they arrange their spaces within, what materials they use, how they worship, right? How, to, how they utilize space, right? But from this, just on face value, you can tell, oh, all right, this might be a space that's inhabited by the descendants of China. Okay, so therefore for Africa, what could it be? For Africa's diaspora, what could it be? This is an image um, by Jerice. He's a game designer. He does visuals, graphics for game designing. Um, it's called Wak Wak Wakongo. Jerice lives in Canada. He's originally from the Congo. And I love to use this image because it just visually gives you that narrative, that story of if Africans, yes, reflected their culture and aesthetics and their materiality, in the built environment, it probably would look like this. We can tell by the coloration, the earth tones, we can tell the patterns, right? We all are very familiar with patterns in Africa. Those masks, I mean, immediately you think of the continent and you know, we never did art for art's sakes. So each of those masks will have a spiritual meaning, whether it's the reverence of our ancestors or if it's a fertility mask, Right? So we would always embody the symbolism and the spirituality of the objects that we create into our built environment. After all, 
architects, architects or artists, and they would draw reference. Again, the coloration, the material is probably clay or laterite or adobe. This is what one would imagine Africa or her diaspora to look like if she were reflecting her identity in her built environment. Okay, so since we, we, we have defined architecture, let's expand to African architecture. For that, I like to use these images because it's very, very powerful to understand the breadth of the African experience. The map on the left shows Africa today after the Berlin Conference when Europe divided and gave Africa its colonial identities, whether you be French, you be English, and so on. The map on the right shows Africa in fact. The hundreds of black lines shown represent the true nations and identities of the people in Africa. There are thousands of them. The red lines that are superimposed show the country lines that we know of today. If you look at the area where Nigeria is, you see that collection of dense collection of black lines. That's because in Nigeria alone, there are over 250 ethnic groups. So you can imagine we are talking about an architectural identity for that area. There would be a plethora of design identities. Some of them will be the same, yes, because of their proximity to, what, to each other. But others would be different because you could stand and walk a mile in any direction and the culture would change, the fashion, the language, the music, the spirituality, the geography, the climate would just change. And all of that, as we said, as they're designing and reflecting in their built environment, it would be unique. It would be unique. They will have our architectural languages. But as I said, I set out on a quest to teach myself because in those days, it was very hard to take classes um, in schools of architecture that would talk about, um, that would represent the African narrative. And so on this journey, doing my master's at Clark Atlanta, I taught myself, I read books and I traveled. You always begin with those nostalgic images of Africa. You look at these and you say, okay, wow, they're beautiful. Uh, the materials are sustainable. It's clay, it's thatch, it's raffia. You see the patterns and the motifs. You see all the different shapes, not just round. You see the one on the top right looks like it's an elephant's head. Um, you see the square buildings as well. Right? This is the no nostalgic reference of architecture in Africa, but it's perfect architecture because it's 100% green. There's no carbon footprint. There's no impact on the ozone layer. These buildings come out from the earth and they can go back into the earth. This was where I started with my research. Again, thinking of culture and identity. There's no way that you can stop without visiting Africa's monumental architecture. That truly is the beginning. Egypt, 10,000 years ago, the pyramids, Lalibela in Ethiopia, Great Zimbabwe, were blessed that they built with stone and that it was hard to destroy these when Africa was being colonized so that these monuments are here to tell our story. That yes, indeed, we have architecture. As a matter of fact, we taught the world. I studied and of course, what do you see in Africa today? You see the impact of colonization, right? So the Arab influence, because the Arabs came to Africa a thousand years before Europeans. So of course there's the Arab influence, there's the European influence. And of course there's evidence of African architecture itself, so that triple, her triple heritage that Ali Mazuri talks about. But covered from coast to coast in Africa, there are examples of this architecture. I'll tell one story just to put in place the meaning, the value of culture and identity in the built environment. In 2005, I was living in the US at this time. The African Union of Architects um, were hosted in Nigeria. It was Nigeria's turn to host um, that year's conference. And so black architects and designers from around the world landed in Nigeria, we landed in Abuja. Abuja was Nigeria's brand new capital. It, we had moved it from Lagos to Abuja because Lagos had become um, very congested. And so Kenzo Tange, Japanese architect and an American town planning firm designed and built this beautiful city for 3 million people. It was a very wealthy city. And so our brand new capital, 
So the African Union, Union of Architects, they host us. We all land from around the world at the Hilton. There's an image in the top right. Spent a week, beautiful lectures and workshops talking about um, our practice in our different countries and sharing progress, also talking about Afrocentric architecture. And at the end of the conference, we all got in our tour buses and headed out to tour the beautiful city of Abuja. And so we're there and, <laughs> and the tour guide is just um, really excited. He's so proud of his new city and he's going, yes, out to your window on the left, you see a beautiful national mosque designed and built by, and he would talk, and out to the right window, you see a national cathedral, very beautiful, and it's designed by, and there's a Sheraton, modern architecture, and he's just going on and on. But it's really quiet in the bus, and so he looks back to see what's happening, and we're just looking at him. And he says, well, why aren't y'all taking any pictures? And the people say, well, uh, we can't, because if we did and sent them to family and friends back in America and Europe, they wouldn't think we were in Africa, they would think we were right next door. Take us to where the monumental modern African pieces of our uh, masterpieces are. Take us to that place, show us Africa. And the poor young man didn't know what to do. He knew he couldn't take us to the village because that's not what a bunch of trained you know, foreign architects wanted to see. And so he was perplexed. This story just shows the meaning and the value of representing your own identity in your own built environment, your true voice, not one that's coming from elsewhere. Part of my research, I also learned that there's this dichotomy in Africa. There's urban and there's rural. On the left, you see an image from Lagos, congested, there's traffic. Okay, you also see rural Africa. Spaces where people are living in harmony with nature, just like they've probably lived for thousands of years. Both of these scenes are contemporary. The people living on the right, you can go into those homes and see televisions, cable TV, people on their cell phones. They are as contemporary as the people on the left. And architects and planners would have to draw, would have to design and build spaces that are comfortable for both, right? So there was that um, dichotomy that I learned as I did my research. The most important area of my um, studies were I wanted to know if indeed we were going to begin building black cities, African cities, diaspora communities that reflected our culture, um, where would we source the most advanced levels of our development in those languages, right? So instead of having to go all the way back to the pyramids or maybe going to the village areas, the rural areas and looking there to see, Let's look at the African civilizations at their highest, before they were conquered or colonized or before the slave trade. What was the height of African civilization? So let me look at how we designed our architecture and our communities then and take elements that were still relevant today and then fast track those now to use as creating spaces for us today and for tomorrow. As we know, Africa is a space um, where oral tradition is how we share knowledge. So I found most of the images in the journals that the travelers kept when they got to Africa. Um, the Kingdom of Benin, Congo, Kumasi, just a few. And you look in those journals and you see how they sketched and how they described the empires or the cities that they came across. Um, master, so well master planned. Um, boulevards, Pillars and columns topped with copper, street lights, communities so well laid out, they made Amsterdam look like a ghetto. These are not my words, these are their words. Their sketches showed civilized layouts um, that just gave all the evidence that I needed that yes, we did indeed design and build um, before they burned, looted, as we all know, took most of our treasures to, to the museums in Europe um, and rewrote history. But in these journals, I did see the evidence of who we were. I gathered information. I was doing research. The final bit came when I understood what happened in the case of our universities. So African independence comes, um, like we learned in, in our opening plenary with Dr. Cynthia Hewitt speaking on Nkrumah 
And those early leaders of, of um, Africa's new nations, when they came here to the States and attended HBCUs and met with um, our civil rights leaders, um, King and X, and they went back and they freed their, their nations. The era of independence in the 50s and the 60s was an amazing opportunity for Africa to reset itself and go back to defining itself in its own identity, not the identity of colonization or slavery or all of that. But let's remember who we were before we um, got colonized and then build from there and fast track um, into our future. It was unfortunate that the universities that were established were established by the exact colonial leaders. And so what did we find? We find out in the curriculum, what students are learning um, is everything from a Eurocentric perspective, not just architecture, medicine and politics, um, history, everything ended up being Europe, Europe focused. And so for those that were in architecture, what were they learning? They were learning how to recreate Europe and Africa. And it wasn't just schools in Africa, design schools there. It was also, of course, universities around the world. What do we teach in our schools of architecture? That was the last, last opportunity to make this image a reality, right? This is what would have happened if indeed at that area of of independence, we had begun to write the new narrative for ourselves in our own identity. You can tell just from looking at this image, if you're familiar with Dogon Mask or Zulu Shields or the pyramids or the Sphinx of Egypt, you can tell immediately that this would be a space that was inspired by the cultures, right? The, the spirituality, the aesthetics of Africa. But I was lucky. I wasn't alone as I did my research. There were people whose shoulders I was standing on. Um, the very first one, top left, Dimas Wonko. He's Nigeria's premier architect, master builder, artist, playwright. He's just a genius, all round genius. His story was similar to mine. In the you know, 50s, he's going to, you know, uh, starting out in college and he gets to school. Again, his university is set up by, in, in Nigeria by the British and he sees young British teachers teaching British architecture to Nigerian students. And he's like, well, what is this? This is not gonna work here. Um, he had grown up in his hometown working with his father who was the king um, to build in the community. And he knew, I mean, African ancestors, all of us know Africa is synonymous with the sun, it's hot. And our ancestors knew you build with clay, you build with adobe because that keeps the heat out. So build, learning to build with cement an imported material that was forced on us after colonization, right? So Britain is selling us cement to build. They are bulldozing our natural communities and having us rebuild with cement and outlawing that we could build with clay. He says, they're not teaching us what, they're not teaching him what he should be learning as an architecture student. So he quit design school and finished in art. But because he's a natural architect, he went on to build the most significant buildings in Nigeria today. I studied his work. I read his books. I spoke with him on a daily basis. His village is right next to mine. That was very easy. Of course, Professor David Hughes, who I met at that Howard um, Noma conference, reading his books, being mentored and guided by him. I had those to follow. William Stanley, my first boss in Atlanta, Georgia, who is also an Afrocentric architect, very good friends with David Hughes. His buildings reflected those Afrocentric ideals that I learned from David Hughes. Dr. Namdi Ele, his book, African Architecture, Evolution and Transformation, was one of the Bibles then that I read and understood the evolution of our story, not just in Africa, but in the diaspora. Philip Freelon, we all know him, his work at the Smithsonian, the African American Culture and History Museum. He drew, he drew inspiration from African aesthetic perfect example. Pierre Atepa, his buildings are all over Africa. Amazing monumental architecture inspired by our culture and our aesthetic. Mariam Kamara, she's young, she's new, I wasn't studying her then, but when you talk about um, an architect trained in the West and moving back to her country in Niger and realizing that she had to relearn all over again to create architecture that related to place, related to the people of her community. 
her examples are incredible. And so she's here. I have people, people to stand on. And so my response to my research was to invite the larger community to join me in this conversation. If we were to create architecture that represented who we were, how would we do that? And so in 2013, came up with the idea of CPD Africa, and that was to welcome everyone to join me. And we would do this through design competitions. 2015, we launched. And the goal was to design a house, a three bedroom house. We started with a house because that's the smallest unit. That Architect you provides listings and, and reviews our goal was to of- Perfect this language there before we scaled it up. But the design brief said, design this house. It should be, it should be built for less than $50,000 because that's affordable, right? And it should reflect the culture, the lifestyle, spirituality, aesthetics, the materials of a community, of an ethnic group in Africa. Understanding that, of course, most of the architects responding to the design brief would not have experienced any of this in class, they wouldn't have learned. I knew I had to begin teaching them a, a little bit so they could respond with confidence to the design brief. Now, as I go through these, I want you to keep in mind, because this lecture is about African-American architecture defined, we can only start a conversation of African-American or African diaspora architecture if we root it in its actual source, which is Africa. And so I began to teach. I found examples and I shared with those who entered the competition. This is the ECOWAS building in Lome, Togo. It's designed by Pierre Guriabe Atepa. You see the shape. You see the objects on the left, the Ghanaian stool and the Egyptian headrest. All right, so we know that the Ghanaian stool, stool is a seat of power of a Ghanaian king. Most of you know the golden stool, all right? It is a seat, it embodies power. The Egyptian headrest was where the pharaohs would lay their heads. The head held wisdom. You don't put the head on the floor on a regular flat pillow, you raise it high. And so the Egyptian headrest was also a seat of power or wisdom. The ECOWAS building was where the West African heads of states would meet to have their uh, convenings and discussions on politics. So this building was a seat of power. So you can see how symbolism in these objects, which you know, we never made art for art's sake, was translated appropriately into the built environment. After all, architecture is an art it would draw from art. The architect is an artist and an architect in one. We only became separated here recently when you had to go and get a degree in architecture and then one in art and then one in community planning <laughs> and, and one in all the other areas that actually make up community, right? So our former local builders, master builders were experts in all of these. I pulled together mood boards. Um, each one represented the aesthetics of a different group. So these are two, this one's from Ghana, the one on the right is from Botswana. I pulled together jewelry, sculpture, fabrics, of course, architecture itself, um, sculpture, and came up with this collage so that the students and those who were, um, re again, responding to the competition would have a source of inspiration, just like what Pierre Atepa did with the previous image. And there, we pulled many of these compilations together and you can see them um, on some of our platforms. We gave lectures about those. We also came up with some prototypes. This one is by Kopji Golit, and he pulled on inspiration from the image in the left. Now this is a building that has um, kind of black and white, but it's black and tan. Um, there's an ethnic group, ethnic group in Nigeria, they're called the TV and their, their colors are black and white. And so when you're thinking also, um, like what colors are your community known for, right? Um, if you're thinking, it, bring it to the diaspora, what col colors is the West Coast known for or, the, or, the, or the, the, the North or where we are here in Georgia? And I know you might think about, okay, gangs and stuff. It's not necessarily gang related, but what are those aesthetics that identify us? So this particular group in Nigeria, they're known, their colors are black and white. The Igbos is red, like red and white. 
right? So we came up with these prototypes. Um, you have people, um, a couple there shown in their black and white attire, the sample traditional architecture, and he came up with a modern. We did several of these to teach. We talked about cultural and spirit, culture and spirituality, right? So this example is by Francis Carey, Burkina Faso. Some of you architects um, are listening. You definitely know of his work. He comes back from Germany and his townspeople want him to design and build a school. They let him know that when children are learning in their community, the ancestors must be there. So whatever he's designing, he can't have a bunch of classrooms that have doors and windows that are blocking out the students. So he had to be mindful of that or they wouldn't you know, have him do their building. So he came up with a plan where you would have courtyard open spaces alternating with the closed spaces. So at any given time, the students are moving between both of these spaces. So there will always be an opportunity for the ancestors to be there when knowledge is being shared with the youth. Now, I give this as an example because if you think about it, this is not a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago, this is now, right? And so spirituality plays a major role in our culture and our lifestyle. And so how do we translate that into the built environment? Here, Francis Carey did a very excellent job with that. He wouldn't have gotten the, the contract otherwise. Also on materials and culture, when you're thinking about um, those elements, um, the image on the left, like I said, there's rural Africa, there's urban. Um, most people think that um, a hut, which is actually a negative word, a round of all, one of those buildings that we see on the left is not a house. Most people think that that's a whole house. It's not. One round room is actually a bedroom or a room in your family house or your family compound. So it takes a collection of those built of those rooms to make up a house, right? So you might have one for the father, you may have one for the first wife, you may have one for the second wife. As you know, polygamy is culture and most Africans um, practice polygamy. So you would have one for the different wives, you would have one for your daughters, for your sons, you would have for your grandma, grandpa, uncles, aunts, nieces, right? The families were extended and a nuclear family was not just a mother and father and children, it was the extended. And you would have all of these rooms surrounded by a courtyard. And the courtyard, open, you see trees growing in there, was the living room. That's where people lived, right? That's where people lived. You only went into your room to sleep. So again, culture as it's reflected in the built environment. So let me give an example here. So in the States, you see the master bedroom, you see that on the floor plan or something or in your house. Um, what it means here is that the, the master bedroom is for the husband and wife, right? So typically in the African culture, husbands and wives did not stay in the same room, right? So the Africans had already figured out <laughs> about you know, the man cave. Yes, he needs his own space, right? So many women had their own spaces. And um, in this courtyard space, that's where you come out and you live, you cook, you sing, you dance, you pray, you teach the children, right? African children were homeschooled. When we talk about, um, you know, we complain a lot in, in the West about, you know, what our children are learning in schools. Well, typically we taught our own histories and language and science and technology to our children in the house, right? Typically we homeschooled. Interesting what COVID is uh, bringing to the table today. But I give these examples again to show, you know, how do you use space? What's important to you? And that's how you will translate it into your built environment. And um, the images on the right are all, like our, our new take, right? On those on the left. So let's say you want to kind of upgrade the living experience of people in the rural environment. You will not take them straight from a family compound like this and put them in a three bedroom house or a mansion. They don't know how to live in that kind of a space. How do you gradually move them um, from one experience to the next? A safe and comfortable gradual experience. Well, these prototypes on, on the right, they, they've all been built. This could be one example. Right, and you can see that they are quite contemporary. You see the lights on and the glass, um, still sustainable. This image um, shows materials, right? So Africa is known for using um, materials right from the very site. 
And um, when we were building, it was a community effort. You weren't talking about, um, unfortunately, architects, don't worry, um, but I'll go ahead and say this. <laughs> it wasn't about paying architects and design fees and community planners and going for zoning approvals and licenses and all, but it wasn't about that. What African people did was come together. So if a young man is about to get married and start his life, the community would come together, family and friends, and would help him build his house. Um, after that, there will be a big feast and he will thank everybody. He will move in. When it's the next person's turn, that person invites everybody to, to help him build his house. And so everything was a communal community effort, right? And so that was one way that the costs were kept down. Again, you use materials right from right there on site. And um, again, this is appropriate for the weather, for, for the climate. Um, but most importantly, pre-colonial times, Africans thought that their architecture was beautiful. Now there's a stigma attached to using local or organic materials. People think, oh no, this is just too ancient or savage and or bush or what we call here country, right? But if you are training your designers, your architects to translate this architecture in a new way, the image on the right would be a perfect example. This is one of the winning designs from one of our competitions the Omo House, and that's rammed earth. Everyone loved that building. So modern, quote unquote, contemporary, but it is, a, it is the exact same material um, used um, from the buildings on the left, right? Um, so standardizing local materials and presenting them in ways that our clients would appreciate or our community members would appreciate um, becomes important. So we had designers from all around the world um, submit their designs. They loved the conversation. Many people wanted to have their names kind of go down in the books of those who had invented, quote unquote, modern African architecture, um, you know, among the first to, to really come up with these languages that you can translate in a modern way that preserves identity and culture of black people. These are some of, some of our winners. Um, Aisha Aminu was a winner for, for 2017. Um, she pulled an inspiration from Egypt in Northern Nigeria. Maidao Lihong was our winner from 2015. She pulled on research from Mali. Uh, she didn't even have to go to Mali, but what I will share here is she said during her research, she found solutions to some of the challenges that Vietnam was facing in its urban environment that Africans had solved thousands of years ago and had forgotten all about. Now, this is a young architect from Vietnam. So if she can say this, what can we say? Those of us that are in Africa, but those of us definitely that are in the, in the diaspora. What about our identity and our culture? Have our ancestors already perfected that because of the last two, three, four hundred years, um, we're no longer aware. That's no longer brought to the classroom. That's no longer talked about at the dinner table. Um, all kinds of science and technology that can solve our issues today. And not just design-wise, but also for community preservation. I'll give you a couple of examples of what was submitted, just so you have an idea. This one came from a civil engineer, actually, from Russia. This building she called The Mask, very beautiful building. Um, she pulled on inspiration from four different masks that she got from West Africa. And again, as I said, masks are not, are not art for art's sake. Each one has a meaning. Again, whether it's ancestor worship, fertility, um, um, celebrating family. So she used her four masks. Each one um, influenced a different facade of her building. It was a, an incredible work of art. She did not win only because she kind of blew her budget. Like I said, it was a $50,000 budget for each building. And um, she went upstairs on this beautiful piece. Um, but this was called a mask. And again, she celebrates spirituality all through this building. So even though somebody might say, okay, this is too heavy for a house. This could be an art gallery. It could be a community center. It could be a boutique hotel. It could be several things. Second place winner from 2017, Olale Khan and Olale Khan Gold from Nigeria, inspired by this and uh, Kalabash. This design is steeped with Yoruba culture and tradition. It was a mixed use development, um, live, work, play, and it celebrated the fact that 
the Yoruba community is all about community. It's all about celebration. It's, how, it's all about being together, right? So again, like what uh, Pierre Atepa did, he drew inspiration from an object within the culture, right? So what objects do we have in our own culture, right? What, what items identify us? What can we draw inspiration from? This one, the Ifa House by Eduardo Soto um, from Puerto Rico, of course, pulling on his African identity after all. Um, we know exactly where we come from in Africa. We come from up and down the West Coast of that continent. So the Ifa House, um, he had all his interior courtyards, just like traditional African architecture. And the columns that held up the roof of his inter interior courtyard were inspired by those found in Yoruba palaces. One of these we will see later inspired Phil Freelon in his museum, um, the Smithsonian. So Ifa House was a beautiful um, submission as well. Uh, I think he won second place in 2015. I'll only share those few um, so I can move now into the next section of, of our talk, which is how do we bring this home to the diaspora? What can we learn and translate here in our new home in the quote unquote new world? Um, we traveled our work around the world to showcase to um, our community, right? To get their, their feedback. And we're very blessed because the response was 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 beautiful. People kept saying, "Oh my God, this is so incredible! Where can I buy one of these? Where are you building these? This I've have never thought about this. How come my architect did not present this to me when I hired them? Um, this is I'm so proud. I can see my culture represented in this architecture. It was all positive, and so that showed us that it was possible. It is possible to translate our identity into the built environment. Most people thought." When I began this conversation, when I would say, um, this was years ago, let's let's come up with a new language for, for black architecture or African architecture. And when I would say this in Africa, they, people would say, what do you mean, a big hut? And I say, no, I don't mean a hut. I say, a modern contemporary translation of our culture and identity. Okay, you mean like a really big one with a plenty thatch roof? I said, no, <laughs> something contemporary. So people always felt whenever I said, Black architecture, African architecture, it would be primitive, it would be ugly, nobody would want it, people would be ashamed. As a matter of fact, people pull down their traditional buildings every day in Africa and replace them with what they see on the internet, right? Um, other people's architecture. But when we showcase this exhibition, people say, oh, this is, this is beautiful, this is a breath of fresh air. I didn't know this was possible. So I invite you all to take a look at some of the submissions, go to our Facebook page, and then you can hear um, some documentary videos of the architects who submitted some of their work. Definitely um, Edward Soto and um, Aisha Aminifor in our house. Um, hear them in their own words. You can take, uh, you can download um, the publication of our first submission um, at Digital Commons. Um, it's for only the 2015, we're working on the 2017 publication now. So you can read more of what was submitted. And then if you wanna get more engaged, with us on our research, definitely go and register your interest at cpdia.africa. Sorry, cpdiafrica.org. You can definitely go there and um, follow our research. But let me let that end the talk on Africa and now bring it home to the diaspora. We've talked about architecture, talk about African architecture. How about African American architecture? The first map that I showed showed. The, 24, the 54 countries that Africa um, is made up of now, those from our colonial um, <laughs> past. And then you saw the one that had the black lines showing the actual. But we have created new African identities based on where we landed when we left Africa. Most of us were taken to Brazil, as you know, is 100 million Africans in Brazil. Caribbean, America, African-Americans, is about 45 million of us. Those are taken to Europe, those are taken to Asia. We have landed in new spaces and have created new cultures, but they all still stem from Africa. At the root, what makes the African diaspora different 
from the people that they live among, whether it's in America, right? We know America was settled by those from Europe, right? Mostly British, or whether it's um, those in South America, those who speak Spanish and Portuguese, right? We, we may be in these new homes and we may have imbibed different cultures, but at the root of who we are as Africans in the diaspora, our identity stems from Africa. For the North American continent, we settled in what is called the Black Belt, Georgia, Texas, the Carolinas, Mississippi. You can see there from the map on the left. After emancipation, we spread out west and out north. But within the states themselves, there are also another level, it's also another level of a Black Belt. You see here, just for example, Alabama, and you see Chicago. You know where to find African Americans. You, you will see the areas in this country where our culture is at its strongest. So with African architecture as our guide, what would African-American elements of culture, aesthetics, spirituality, materials, and development philosophies be? How would we translate that? We would have to understand what makes us African in order to translate that into the built environment so that it will look different from what another person's culture is as they translate that into their built environment, right? And so when the professor said, or some people have been told even recently, well, we don't have a culture that is our own. That is not true, right? We can think about so many things. And most people just go immediately to music because Music was the easiest one. I mean, you, we, we got on the boats, we knew how to sing, we knew what a drum sounded like, we knew how to dance, it was in our DNA. You come here, you teach your children. That was an easy one, but there was so much else that came with us. What are those things? Beginning the conversation, I start with three distinct origins. When creating African American languages, we will talk about those traditions and aesthetics inherent in our Africanisms, what we brought from Africa. We would also talk about the American culture of injustice and racism. That's American culture. That's at the root of American culture, it's injustice and racism. So for us as an African American people, we would be responding to that as well. And then there would be the European culture that we have imbibed from becoming African-Americans, right? So at one point we were Africans and now we're African-Americans. Meaning that part of our culture comes from Europe because we live amongst people who came from Europe, right? So those three things. So going back to the first thing, those Africanisms, how do we get, how do we source for the Africanisms? So first of all, to be Sankofa, go back and fetch, right? And um, we talk about cultural appropriation. This is not cultural appropriation. If it was yours and it was taken away from you, you have the right to take it back, right? So it's not cultural appropriation to go back to Africa and pick up the garment of identity. You can wear it however you wanna wear it, but it is yours. You can translate it any way you want to translate it, but it is yours. So, so Sankofa, go back and fetch. Ubuntu, learn to work together. Like I said, that's what, we, that's what we did. We worked together to build and design our communities and to maintain them, to raise our families. It wasn't the family raising a child, it was the entire village. We worked together. What kind of culture is that and how do you translate that? Afrofuturism, amplifying our connection to the cosmos calling into existence the experience of life from an African-centered worldview, the past, the present, and the future. Of course, the issue of racism and injustice, social justice, equity, and preservation. Us always fighting these cycles every 20 years, we're going through another gentrification, right? There are architects and planners who specialize in racism and injustice in the built environment loads of information. You don't even have to go learn. We experience it every single day, what that means to live in a racist environment, right? So how would we also design to respond to that and to protect ourselves from injustice and racism? Let's go back to the Africanisms. We'll talk less on racism and more about culture. 
All right. So it's not very difficult to understand where to start. We all know most mm -hmm. of us in diaspora came from the West Coast of Africa. So your natural, nat natural ethnic group, before you even do a DNA test, right, would be, you know, you're from an ethnic group in Nigeria, Yoruba, you might be from the Congo, you might be from Republic of Bene, Cameroon, Togo, Guinea, Sierra Leone, right? So we know we are from the West Coast. So we will connect the dots there. I showed this image because um, it's very interesting. I was teaching um, some students over my summer internship and I had them bring out images of very traditional architecture. And it was really, really hard to even detect the difference between the buildings that we first built in those plantations when we got off the boats. We built replicas of where we were coming from, right? And there's a couple on here that have chimneys. So you know that those are the ones that are definitely in America because we didn't have any chimneys in West Africa. But connecting the dots to who we are, who we are um, is easy in our built environment. Just start from the very beginning. What did we build when we got here? And start picking out the elements, right? These are some examples from Tata Somba, Haiti, Jamaica, Yoruba, Congo, Hausa, Jar, of course, uh, the Mississippi um, and Igbo architecture. There's a lot to read and study on. Just reading a couple of these opened my eyes. And um, you'd be amazed at things that we do in America that we just might say, um, yes, that's what we do as an American culture. We're African Americans, that's what we do. But until you see those things, those exact same practices being done in Africa, you wouldn't you have to go to Africa to see. And then the light bulb goes off and you realize, oh my God, we really are from Africa. Right. So doing a lot of research, this reading these types of publications, you will begin to pick out those things that actually make the diaspora unique. The one that I love the most is that cultural appropriation. In your studies, you will find out that there are a lot of practices that have been culturally appropriated by mainstream. That's not news to you. We know about that in fashion and music and so many other things, right? Sports, anything we do is somebody else <laughs> gets credit for it. But in the built environment, have we really dug to see what about European architecture and Western architecture is actually African? And these images, y'all can tell some of them, especially that middle one, we know very easily. Um, just thinking about the effort, the energy and the money it took to lift that obelisk out of Africa there are more obelisks in, 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 in Europe and in America than there are left in Egypt, right? You look at these pillars and these, these columns, what were the Greeks and the Romans doing in Egypt once they conquered it? They were copying and renaming things as their own. These are just very exa easy examples, but there's so much more that once we research and we identify it, then we'll know, okay, that was mine. Now I can take that and build upon it. Uh, these two images, um, it's flashing between them, um, just so you see. This is an example of aesthetics, coloration. One of them is African-American and one of them is African. All right, so that one is African. You can tell probably easily because of the patterns on the faces down there in the bottom left, but that's only because those are patterns. When you look at the one from the African-American collection, you see the colors also on the faces. Patterns are not there. But a, an Adinkra pattern made by someone in Ghana or a Uli pattern made by somebody in Igbo land, right? Or a Kosa pattern made by somebody in South Africa. It's because their artists and their creators sat down to create those shapes, right? And those, and those, and those patterns. So as an African or a diaspora community, what stops our artists and architects from creating patterns that reflect us, that have our meanings attached? Kind of example, good example I like to give is um, Black Space, a group out of New York. In their manifesto, they have created new symbols and given them new meanings that represent their understanding and their belief on how we can move forward with creating Black spaces, right? Safe spaces for African-Americans and Africans in the diaspora. So taking that creative license, one has the complete right to do so. So what are those patterns and motifs that we would come up, come up with as those of us in the diaspora that will identify us. So when I see that pattern, I know, okay, this must be, um, I must be in Haiti, because I know that this is a Haitian pattern, or I must, I must be in Jamaica, or I must be in Southwest Atlanta. 
I must be in Harlem. I must be in, in Compton, right? Because our designers have created that aesthetic. The aesthetic is very important because it's the first thing that people see, right? What you see tells that first story that identifies you. So the aesthetic becomes very important, right? Africans have done this all along. Why would we want to stop that now just because we're in the diaspora? No, we continue to do so. We would look at precedent and what African-Americans have already built, right? I love to give this story about um, Robert Taylor's beautiful Tuskegee because um, it was built by the students and the professors. They dug the clay out the earth and they built their school. They built their community with their hands. That is something that Africans have done since day one, working together to build, right? So we talk about the fact that we don't have money. When African people, African people, the same as black people, right? Are actually the wealthiest people on the planet, right? Everyone's still benefiting off of what comes from Africa, whether it's the resources or the, or the people that's themselves, right? We are the wealthiest. However, we don't have the money. So if we don't have the money, how can you still build? Well, you can still build because you can come together and do that. That's how Africa was built. I don't know how much they paid the people to build the churches in Alibela or the pyramids or raise them. I don't know, but it's not always about the money, right? So what kind of spaces do we need in our communities? How can we come together and say, okay, I'm building a new community. 20% of that has to be sweat equity contributed by the members of the community. Everybody put on your, your hard hats and, and start molding some bricks. I know it can be done because when Millet Fuller, who was former president, um, founder of Habitat for Humanity, when he was sitting in the Congo in the 1940s, watching some Congolese build um, a new family home for a young man and the light bulb went off in his head that, oh, pull the people together and let them build. And he comes back to America and he creates Habitat for Humanity. I know it can be done because that was an African concept. We can do it too, if we actually want to. I love this building, the Oaks, um, Tuskegee. Um, I probably wasn't inspired by these four images on the on the on the right. <laughs> they look very similar to me. Um, of course, the material is the same. Um, but just looking at what we built in the diaspora and connecting those dots, Afrofuturism. Paul Revere Williams, first African American architect. If this, if he wasn't building this as an Afrofuturist building, I I'm saying he did. Um, what what can, what have we created? What are we creating? Another amazing piece by him. La Concha Motel in Las Vegas, Philip Freelon, um, I love his stories. He says when he would design, you know, he's an ancestor now. Um, he would put African objects on the conference table and have his architects just walk around and sketch and sketch and they would come up with their buildings. He was always pulling inspiration from Africa. Here you see the Gullah Geechee quilt work um, on the facade of his building. This one is a no-brainer. Um, take my hat off for this one. You see the um, the Yoruba sculpture that inspired this building on the far left, and uh, the corona of that um, totem pole. It looks very much like what Af West African women wear now. The gele, which is that very fancy headrest. We'll come back to that. Um, the work by Jack Travis, you can see him. This is this is uh, the Kalahari condos in New York. He's pulling on that African pattern. Anybody sees that, you think immediately. Um, he's got, um, we won't call this graffiti, but we'll call these murals, all right? Africans have always done murals on their buildings, um, sculpted most often by women. Stanley loves Stanley's um, Ebenezer Baptist Church here in Atlanta, because my, uh, my first boss. He pulled inspiration from Ghanaian um, Adinkra patterns. I can see the columns and the pillars on the inside of the church. Everyone was different. Um, giving true respect to David Hughes' Afrocentric architecture. Um, also with his lighthouse um, there at uh, CAU, pulling on inspiration from uh, Laribela, Ethiopia. Very, very possible to reflect Africanisms in our built environment here. If, if you know what you're looking at, you know immediately. If you don't know, fine, somebody might have to explain to you. But when you see something that's African inspired, you will know. Well, the, those are just a few images. Um, there's so many more um, examples in the diaspora where our architects have actually pulled on an Afrocentric um, language to build in our built environment.
And I like to focus more on the Africanisms and less on racism. But um, in our upcoming design competition, we will have those who are participating to submit designs that reflect their own specific culture. So if you're an African-American and you're submitting, we'll have you do this kind of research and submit a design that celebrates African-American culture, right? That stems from Africa and incorporates our experience here in, in America. If you're from Haiti, if you're from Jamaica, if you're from, from Brazil, show us those Africanisms and give us something new. Of course, those from Africa would do the same thing. Um, so it's a lot of research that has to be done, but yes, where do you start? You really do start by listing those elements of your culture that make you you. Um, again, going back to music, which is just so easy to use, those drums and those beats and those rhythms, we did not bring those from London. We don't come from London. We come from Africa. The rhythm and the music is an Africanism, right? So how many more elements of African-American culture or African diaspora culture can you list? Can you list up to 20? 30 of them that you say, okay, this is how we do, this is how we use space. And so it is those now that the architects will begin to use to create our built environment, right? And um, what do we do most with our time? We do sports. I know a lot. We do a lot of music, entertainment, performance. In Africa, those things were done on the outside. Do those kinds of things need buildings? Let's talk about that. So as I round up, some of that research, of course, is going to reflect the culture, our shared culture, right? Black people, African people, diaspora people, that connection to the outdoors, to the sun, to the environment, it just has not been broken. It cannot be broken. We love the outdoors. We're forever barbecuing and having family reunions and we're always gathering outside and whether it's on the corner of the street and we're talking, we're, we're communicating. We live outside. That shared culture has not dropped. You see images of African-Americans on, on the left, barbecuing, there's a wedding outside. You see a festival in Africa, you see a wedding. Um, the groomsmen dressed up there on top, right? So that shared culture of living life on the outdoors. Aesthetics, I showed these. You see an African here doing, um, I'm not gonna call it graffiti, I'm gonna say murals. Um, you see the examples there, Obama, you see um, um, it's, uh, come on, Madly. <laughs> you see, um, all right, his name will come to me in a second, Miles Davis, there we go on the top. And then you see the Igbo woman painting the Uli pattern on the building on the bottom right, right? So we've always painted um, on our buildings that tell our stories, that celebrate our ancestors, right? What we love, music. So this, this collection is from Africa and the diaspora. The shared spiritual practices, you know, um, when you think about why we pour libations, why do African-Americans and Africans and diaspora pour libations? Where did that start? Where does that come from? All right, we know it comes from Africa. There's somebody there pouring libation. Typically there is an ancestor who's buried there, whether they're buried in the house or they're buried outside you're pouring that libation, you, you're remembering them, you're feeding them, you're giving them drink, you're speaking to them before you now partake in your own conversation with the living or partake in your dinner or your breakfast with the living. You respect the ancestors. So libations, it's a, it's a shared spiritual practice throughout the diaspora. Here the young man is pouring drink to a fallen comrade. Um, that is definitely a part of our experience here. Shared use of sustainable materials. Um, this is an image of Howard. Um, we use clay. We use the materials that were right there available on site. None better than how Tuskegee was built. Like I said, with the students and professors coming together um, and building their school with their own hands and managing it and protecting it, right? That is what our communities would do. And so this vision is where architecture for me meets Afrofuturism, designers, activists, agriculturists, spiritualists, planners, educators, every discipline required to build as our ancestors did when they built the great civilizations of Africa. We own that. That 
science and technology and wisdom belongs to us. I can never overemphasize. It is not cultural appropriation. It is ours to build upon. And so as I leave you to ponder the complexity of this conversation, I will close with two last images. One very powerful, I love this. This is from the 2016 Grammys by Kendrick Lamar. He ended his performance with this image. He put Compton back in Africa. And the image is just worth more than a thousand words to me. You know, if we were designing and building our communities here and we were to lift them and put them right back in Africa, would they say Africa? Would they say black? Um, or would we be lifting communities that look nothing like us, that don't celebrate us, that don't reflect how we actually live and utilize space and commune with the environment and worship, right? How would Compton have been designed and built? So when it's fit back into Africa, it looks like it belongs in Africa because after all, African diaspora people are African people. If Freelon could do this with this Yoruba sculpture on the far left, if he could do that to create this amazing, beautiful building that we have now in Washington, DC, surely we could do this. <laughs> All hail Queen Cicely Tyson with that hat. That would inspire some architecture that would just wow anybody coming to any African-American community <laughs> and seeing a monumental piece, a masterpiece of architecture built, inspired by this headdress. Uh, so Queen Cicely Tyson, we thank you. Thank you everyone for um, listening to this presentation and I look forward to your questions and, and I hope I can answer them very well. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline, <laughs> very much. Um, I, do, um, I do want to bring uh, your attention to a question that was put in the chat asking what does the future of African architecture look like? I personally haven't learned a lot about it until now and I think it's just so beautiful. In other words, what are some ways to incorporate knowledge of African architecture in our current time? This is definitely information that should be in our curriculum in schools today. Okay, great, great question. And that's, I mean, you almost answered it right there. It's the curriculum, right? So what are we learning in our schools um, from Africa to the diaspora? What are we learning? We should be learning how to, to, to design and develop our communities, right? For five years of design school, another two for your master's, then you go do your internship for three years and then you get a license. That whole time, you really should be perfecting how to go and manage your own community, not graduate and get a job and help others to build up their communities, others to build up their countries, right? So it really does need to start with the schools. We have to change what we teach, right? Not just in architecture, in everything. Um, the fact that, you know, in Africa and in the Caribbean, we used to know what trees to go and, and, and pluck leaves or take off the bark and boil it and drink it. That was salt, that will um, cure your malaria. It'll take away your headache if you have a migraine. Um, we knew how to heal ourselves. Now, because we don't talk to grandma and nobody goes to the village and nobody talks about what I just said at the dinner table, you go to school and you learn that if a tablet doesn't come from China or somewhere, then you're just gonna die of malaria, right? If, if, <laughs> if they can't get just the simple things that you used to know, now you're depending on other people because what you're doing is learning their curriculum in school, that's where the problem starts. So the education system needs to be overhauled so we can learn the magic of our, of, of our architecture and, and begin to build that when we when we graduate. Thank you. I um, there are some great comments. Everyone is applauding you and thanking you. And uh, we know that you are now moderating another panel that starts at six thirty. And um, and for those of you who are on, that is the panel on gentrification, Afrotourism, and community preservation in the diaspora. 
Um, so we're going to be transitioning over to that session. The, another question that did come up is, are these slides, we do have the recordings that are going to be available, but somebody was asking if these slides will be uh, able to be available to be shared with some architects. Okay, definitely. Um, you can always reach out to me um, through Africa Awareness Week or through the cpdiafrica.org platform. Um, you will find a lot of this information already on our website. Um, and if you want more questions, just email me. I'll be glad to share. Um, also, if you um, come out of this session and go on to the next session, I know we, we can talk a lot, so <laughs> there might not be a lot of time for Q&A. But next session, we're going to hear from um, experts who are actually practicing this out in the real world and hear their stories, including Professor Mickey Harris. So if you all do um, join us back in, the, in 15 minutes in the next se session, we'll be able to hopefully do some more Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yes, yes. Thank you. All right. So we'll see you all soon. <laughs> okay. <Thank> you. <laughs>